Uh, for those of you who follow me on YouTube, by now you know the topic that I have so much interest in. You know, after I made that video, that eight minute video on masturbation, uh, there has been like an outpouring of support and response from all over the world uh, which has further like highlighted the need for us to really talk about these sexual issues that we have every day because well, as soon as someone is born and they start growing up the moment you cross your age of innocence the next major challenge you're going to face in life is sexual in nature and uh, very few people actually understand uh, what these things are all about or actually what sexual intercourse is all about and that's why that video has continued to trend all over the world and have the kind of impact it's having on people and so today today to back up everything I have ever told you about sexual intercourse and you know, sexual immorality especially in the body of Christ I want us to go to the origins where it all began and I I know I used to tell people I said you don't need to run to New Testament to understand sexual intercourse you need to go to the book of Genesis the beginning to understand the origin of sexual intercourse or sexual attraction and that's basically what this is all about today I want to show you or rather teach you the origin of sexual attraction as it is written in the book of life, the book of Genesis. If you have King James version of the Bible, you can open it up and go through this Bible study with me right now. Uh, the book of Genesis chapter one, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. <laughs> and so God created man in his own image. Listen. In the image of God created he him, singular. Male and female created he them, plural. So male and female created in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. And the Bible says in 28, it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God created male and female, and gave authority to them to dominate, to take dominion. He said they should be fruitful, male and female. Okay, but then, if you still have your Bible spread out in front of you, <laughs> I want you to follow me all the way to Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Wait a minute. Didn't we just hear that in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 that God created male and female? And here in chapter 2 verse 7, the Bible says that God formed man, only one, and breathed the breath of life into him. <clears throat> what happened to the female that was created with the male in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27? Where did the female go? Because this is progressive. You have to count one before you count two. This is happening in chapter 2 verse 7. The Bible is telling the story as it happened. In other words, there is no argument that God already created male and female before he formed the man which is the male. So what is going on here? 
How can you create male, female, and then suddenly you form a male? In the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, what God did was he created the spirits of both the male and the female. The word create in Hebrew means bara. And bara means to, to create something out of nothing. The spirit of man was created out of nothing. There was no substance that you can say God went here and brought this and created the spirit of man. He created the spirit of man supernaturally out of his own magnificence, out of his own supernatural power. Nothing that you can trace. And so that's what happened in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. The spirits of both male and female were created at the same time. And when God was giving that order to them, command to them, he said, go, be fruitful, multiply, take dominion over this, over that, over that. He was giving the, the, the command to both the male and the female, not only to the man. He gave the command to the male spirit and the female spirit because both of them were created at the same time. <laughs> And so what happened then in the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 was that God now decided to play a beautiful game which is why you need to pay very close attention. Follow me so we don't miss anything here. God now came and decided now in the realms of the physical he said the first that will show up is the male. And so he took something and formed the male, which you and I know it was the soil. He took earth, the soil, and he put it together and he formed the male. So what is the word formed in Hebrew? It is called yatsar. And yatsar means to beat something into shape. So in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, what the Bible is saying here is that God took the log, that log of clay, you know when you see people who are sculptors or people who are uh, uh, craftsmen who work with clay, okay, or potters or something, when they get a log, they will now begin to beat it into shape. What God did in chapter 2 verse 7 was that he took a log of clay that had been mixed and began to push shape into it. He made a hole here for the eye. He put the hand and, and cut it very nicely and crafted it nicely and did all the shape that we have to do. He put it together. That's what the Bible says he did in chapter 2, verse 7. He formed the man. He had sarred the man. Put him into shape. But then he was still clay. And the man needed to be flesh and blood. But he was still clay. So God released an essence from him into that body. And the body became flesh and blood. Flesh and blood, but there was no life in it, so the man was still not living. So after man became flesh and blood, man was still dead. There was no life in him because the only life in a man is the spirit of the man, which makes the soul to come alive. So first of all, God's essence went into man, transformed the clay into flesh and blood. Man remained dead, no breath. So what he did next was, the Bible says in the same seven, he said, and he breathed the breath of life into him. After he did that, what happened? The Bible says, and man became a living soul. Without the breath, the flesh and blood that he had made supernaturally was not going to be alive. So man became a living soul after the breath went into him. But guess what? If you check your concordance Bible or your study Bible or reference or whatever Bible you use for your study, go and look at the very definition of the life that is referenced here in this passage. Where the Bible says, and the Lord gave and breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life, and man became a living soul. 
That life there is actually plural and not singular. Okay, I know by now you're wondering if this is the breath of life. What is Joseph trying to talk about here? Does that mean that Adam was carrying two different spirits inside of him? Well, the truth of the matter is yes. Adam was carrying two different spirits inside of him. Adam, by right, spiritually speaking, was spiritually bisexual. He had the spirit of two sexes in him. The sex of a male and the sex of a female. And these two spirits, which is the spirit of life, came from inside God into him. And the question that anybody who thinks critically will ask is, how come the breath from God's nostrils is going into Adam and there are two spirits? Okay, if you want to prove to us that these two spirits are now the spirit of Adam and Eve, which God created in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, how did he manage to take them out of himself into the man? So let me give you the most profound mysteries you've ever heard in your entire life. The mystery of what happened here is that the God of heaven needed to do something to make sure that he preserves his creation. And what God did, that what God said, I am going to yoke the two spirits together and I'm going to explain to you why he had to do that. The spirit of Eve and the spirit of Adam were yoked. You know, if you take two eggs, you know, eggshells have different colors. There are some that are pinkish, there are some that are white, there are some that are whatever color. When you put them in a bowl, I can separate the pink from the white. When you remove the shells and put the yolk and mix the yolk, what you call yoking together, when you yoke them together, you know it is practically impossible to separate it, right? The spirits of the man and the woman are the yokes. So God yoked the two spirits together and made them into one spirit. And so they still carried the same, the, all the, the different DNAs, but they were one. This one was still a female spirit and this was still a male spirit, but they were one single spirit. How was he able to do this? And what was the reason? And where did he do that? So in other words, where did the breath of those lives come from? They came from the Most High. In other words, the Lord God Almighty, the Almighty Creator, took the two spirits of man and woman and put them inside of himself, took them in himself, and incubated them within himself and then molded two into one within himself because that was from where the breath came out god birthed marriage inside his womb and released it first of all into the container of the male man what happened in his womb was marriage when you say two shall become one the first place where it happened was in the womb of god the mixture or the yoking together of the two spirits happened inside the womb of God. That's why the breath came out of him into the man. Because if it came from another source, we would say that is where he went to do the mixture. And just in case you don't believe that these two spirits were mixed and pumped into Adam, I want us to read further down. First of all, if you go to verse 20, the Bible says, And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. And he never complained to God. Because the guy was complete already on the inside. <laughs> Praise God. So now in verse 21, the Bible says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof in other words when Adam fell into a deep sleep what God was planning to do was and as he went into what they call an aesthetic sleep or anesthesia he was about to perform an anesthesia I don't know how they say but it's like when you the, 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 the machine takes your life and it's like you're practically dead or clinically dead more like 
and then an operation is carried on the person. They call it anesthesia, right, if I'm not mistaken. Now, in that state, you are physically not conscious of anything. That's the state God caused Adam to fall into. That's why it is called here a deep sleep. He was physically conscious of nothing whatsoever. And so God took away the rib. And then after he took away the ribs, the Bible says he closed up the place with flesh instead thereof. What does that mean? That he patched up the place, he healed Adam. But the Bible says Adam remained in that sleep until God were done making his wife. Why not let Adam wake up and move so we can have record that he finished and went about his business? No. Adam was left in that deep sleep. I want you to keep your thoughts there. He was left in that deep sleep while God was making the woman for Adam. Remember when the Bible said God made man, he made man in his image. That made man, made there stands for, is in Hebrew, is called Asa. And Asa means to make something out of what is already in existence. But when the Bible says God made a woman or made him a wife or made him a, 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 a Eve, that made, when God is referring to making Eve, the made there means a different thing altogether. In Hebrew, that one is panga. And panga means to skillfully build something. So God made man, is asa, making something out of what is already in existence. And God made woman simply means panga. And panga means to skillfully, in other words, skillfully build something. What it means is that man was just made, the woman was built. So, if you look at it properly or critically, you will find out that the time it took God to build the woman is way, way more time, more than the time it took him to make the man. So she was built, that's why, that's what explains the complexities that surround womanhood. That's why when we put our eyes on them, we can't get our eyes off them. Objects of beauty and attraction. God built them. Like I always say, <laughs> women to me are like Lamborghinis and Bugattis. Women, we are just like Toyota Corollas and you know, all those small pickups. <laughs> women are complex. It took time to build them. But here's the deal here. When God was taking the ribs to go and build Eve, why it was, was it was only the physical component that the rib signifies? What is it that God took from Adam to signify the spiritual component of Eve? Because after building the physical body of Eve, she would need her own breath of life. And there's no place where the Bible recorded that God breathed into Eve her own breath of life. Because God separated the spirit of Eve the moment he took the rib to go and make Eve. He separated the spirit of Eve from the spirit of Adam. So that when he was done building Eve, he then pumped the Eve spirit inside of her body. And when he did that separation, you remember that they were yoked together and pumped into Adam? And when he was going to now build a woman, he now separated the yoke and he's the only one who could have done the separation. When he separated the yoke, what do you think happened? A massive vacuum was left in the spirit column of Adam. Why did God play this game? <laughs> when God created man in his image, God created man to be a free will agent. In other words, God had made up his mind that he would never interfere in the, anything that has to do with man's decision. Even your decision to serve him or serve the devil, he will not interfere in it. Absolute freedom. And so if that was going to be the case, God had already looked into the future and seen that because I am making man to be a free will agent, a time will come when males will say to hell with women, we are going on our own. In fact, we are setting up our own planet on earth. And then women will say to hell, we don't need men anymore. Which is what is happening in this day and age of LGBT already. And God said, no, if I leave things the way they are, 
the whole essence of making man, which is to procreate, which is to take dominion of the earth and take over everywhere and represent my image on the earth, will be defeated. So what did he do? He wanted to leave a permanent vacuum in the soul, in the spirit of the man, that will make him to forever, as long as he lives on this earth, to forever have a desire for a woman. It's a magnetic field he has to create in the regions of the spirit of the man that will never be deleted for as long as he lives on this earth. So that when you get to that Adamic age of maturity, you will always have a flare. That attraction will open up and you will desire for a woman to come to you. And there was no other way he could have done it other than to mix the two spirits together when they have become one like a chemical solution, he will not supernaturally separate it, leaving an indelible mark. An indelible mark in the spirit regions of the man. Indelible mark. That is why today, no matter who you are, when you get to that age of Adamic maturity, you will begin to feel the thing. Oh my gosh, I need a woman. Have you seen some men that they, they, they've never really bothered about women, but they get to a certain age in their life, they're like, I need a wife now. Because that vacuum has opened up. This was the game that God was playing. And can I prove it further to you? So here's what happened. The Bible says, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from, from man made he a woman. That's the maid I was talking to you about. This maid here is panga. It means to skillfully build something. Made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Verse 23, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. Hello? She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. When God did his anesthetic operation, please help me somebody, was Adam not physically unconscious? Was he not in a deep sleep? How could he have such very, detail, such very vivid details of what God did while he was almost practically dead? Who told him all this? Let me read it again. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones. First of all, God, I saw when you took the rib. And flesh of my flesh, I saw when you collected part of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. I saw when you took her, which is the spirit is who you are. She was taken out of man. In other words, your spirit was yanked from my own spirit. Who told him? Because you know why he knew? You know why he knew all this? He knew because while his body was physically unconscious, his spirit was alive. His spirit witnessed every single thing that God did. The rib, the flesh, and the spirit separated from him. He went to build his wife. Adam witnessed everything with absolute clarity. He saw God do all of that. So when God brought the woman, Adam did not take permission from him. But guess what? So you to also know further. Let me prove it more for you. Have you asked yourself, when God had taken the rib from Adam and he healed him up, why did he not allow Adam to go about his business and continue to name all the animals that he was naming, which he was doing a good job of? You know why? The reason is because when that spirit of Eve was separated from the spirit of Adam, you notice, like I said, a vacuum was created immediately. And you know what that vacuum is? God created this vacuum in such a way that it has a strong magnetic field. And God thought to himself, if I allow Adam to wake up and become conscious, what will happen is that Adam will begin to approach the animals that he's supposed to give names to and begin to seek to have sex with them immediately because the vacuum has opened up. And by right and by nature, Adam is instantly supposed to be vulnerable sexually. 
and he's supposed to begin to look for somebody to fill that vacuum sexually. So God said, no, I'm not going to let this happen because it's going to end up becoming, a, 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 engaging in bestiality, sleeping with animals, or even going to sleep with a tree or something. He could not control it. So God said, let me lock him up in the body. And so God locked him up in that deep sleep until he was done building his wife. So that the moment his wife shows up, he can unleash that sexual intense energy on his own wife rather than on animal. That's why God left him in the deep sleep until he was done building Eve. Because the vacuum has been left open. Before the vacuum was left open, Adam was so complete and cool. He didn't even care if he had somebody or if he didn't have somebody. Even before God mixed the two spirits, he was okay with himself. But you see what God has done now? Chemically speaking, God has left a vacuum that will forever make Adam always be drawn sexually to Eve, which is what we are suffering today in our world. That's why when God brought Eve to Adam, Adam did not take permission from God. He didn't even care that he had never seen anything like woman before. All the animals he named, none looked like his wife. All the trees he saw in the garden, none looked like his wife. Rather than be shocked initially and say, who is this? I've never seen anything like this. God, what do I do with this? He went ahead and claimed his wife, the Bible said. And then Adam said in verse 23, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall even give the wife name immediately. God had nothing to say. God said, well, you said it all. Goodbye. He took off and went his way. Because Adam witnessed everything. So this is the origin of sexual attraction forever. You, if you ever wondered where did this strong sexual attraction come from, this right here is the origin, the very first origin of sexual attraction in our world. That's how God left this thing that is causing trouble everywhere in the hearts of men. That no matter how much you hate women, you will still see that thing there that draws you sexually to a woman. And if God didn't do it, our world would have been in a major, major crisis by right now. That's the origin. This is why sex is not meant for babies. You have not asked yourself, if God, if God had created man and woman to grow up as babies, what do you think they would have done with this? Do you think God is stupid? Haven't you wondered that the Lord God Almighty, in his own infinite wisdom, went and created male and female as full grown, fully grown adults? Fully grown adults. Why did he do that? Why not just create them as babies and let them grow into maturity? Adam and Eve were created as adults. You know why? Because God knew he was going to play this game. He knew he was going to introduce the power of sex. He knew he was going to initiate sexual attraction. And so he knew that if he was going to do that, that the intensity and the energy and the power of this sexual energy is too intense and too much for anybody less than a full-grown adult to deal with. That's how you know that sex is not meant for babies, it's not for teenagers. It is meant for fully-grown adults. The question is very clear to you here, except if you have a Bible that says that Adam and Eve were created as babies. No, they were made as fully grown, fully mature adult because of what God was about to introduce, sexual attraction. That's why today the enemy is now beginning to cross boundaries and taking this sexual urge and sexual intensity and energy and pushing it down the line of the food chain where babies are, where teenagers are. And you can see how it's messing with their brains. You can see how it's mesmerizing them. You can see how that the thing is destroying our younger generation. Because sexual energy is meant to be contained and dealt with by people who are fully mature. But today you see babies dealing with sexual energy. Sexual energy is one of the most pure, one of the purest 
form of the deposits that God has ever deposited into any man or woman. Sexual energy. That's why the demons come for it. When you masturbate, they are harvesting it from you. Sexual energy is an energy that defines, that it reminds you that God is living inside of you. It's an energy that defines it. It tells you that God lives, inhabits in you. Every ounce of sexual energy actually came from God. And that's why the demons need it. And he uniquely made it to be for this our word. That's why when they have it from you, they are able to navigate through the word and they are able to oppress you by every means. I want us to see if we can get a confirmation from chapter 5. A confirmation that puts a tab to every single thing that I've explained to you here. In Genesis chapter 5, let us read from verse 1. The Bible said, this is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man. In the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them. Listen, in verse 2. He said, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Where did God call their name? He said, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. So he called their, their, is plural, their name were called one name. He called their name, two of them were called Adam. That was what happened in chapter 2 verse 7. When God formed the man and breathed the breath of them, lives into him. This also lends credence to the fact that it was the breath of lives that were breathed into one man in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. The Bible says here in verse 2 of chapter 5 that he called their name Adam. Adam. So when Adam became, was formed and God breathed that breath of life, the name that they gave him which was Adam was actually for two of them until Eve was separated in chapter 2 verse 20 something. <laughs> Do you see that? Until Eve was separated, their name, their name was Adam. The breath of life. The scripture is not complicated. We just need the, the leading and guiding and guidance of the Holy Spirit. The name called Adam. And so I put it to you today that this right here is the very origin of sexual attraction and the takeaways here today is this God intends for man to be fully mature before they indulge in the act of sexual intercourse God initiated and birthed marriage inside his own very womb the Lord God Almighty wants the earth to be dominated by man and the woman he wants us to procreate. He wants us to be fruitful. And when you find out you are not being fruitful, you must have given your authority to the powers of darkness who try to access us through the regions of emotional manipulation. And that's why you have things like pornography, masturbation, fornication. All these things are emotional manipulation of the devil. The devil, the demons do not have the power to operate in our earth unless they have this same God-given energy that we carry with us. I am telling you the truth. Demons are meant to be in hell. The only way they can come to the earth is they steal the energy of a being that is built for the earth. Our bodies were built, custom-made for this earth, this planet. That's why if you want to leave this earth and go to the moon, you have to put on another suit to be able to suit your movement in the moon because your body was not built for the moon, neither was it built for Jupiter or for Venus. Any of those planets you want to visit, you must wear something to protect yourself. But when you are here on earth, you don't need to wear anything because God specifically built ourselves, our skins for this very earth and made us to be kings here and to dominate. And so every time a demon is oppressing somebody or is dominating in our lives or in our businesses or families, it is because they have taken or stolen energies from us. Before man fell through disobedience by listening to serpent, the devil came into the garden as a serpent. Guess what? Why did he come as a serpent? 
The devil came as a serpent because the only energy that was available for him to use before man came was the energy of a serpent. So he stole that energy and manifested like a serpent and went to deceive man. As soon as man fell through disobedience, the enemy began to steal the energies of man and suddenly they began to take the shape of man and began to manifest and mold themselves into the shape of man. That's how you have what you call the aliens. If you doubt what I'm saying, go to your Google and Google and do a search on reptilians. The Google search will tell you that the first original aliens that showed up on this earth are known as reptilians. Up to now, they are still called the reptilian race. What is reptile? Reptile is a form of animal. It is not a form of demon. The demons came and first of all, the first ones they found out to steal their energy was reptiles. So they stole the energies of reptiles and used it to get access into our world. But now, they don't even meet the reptiles anymore. They are now stealing the energies of human beings. And so they are appearing like us. They have six fingers. They have six toes. They are just having fingers and toes. They are not supposed to have these things. They take these energies from us that they can be able to operate in our world and dominate us. No demon has right to operate within your territory if he has not collected or stolen energy from you or from the people around. This is the energy that God gave us at creation. It is so precious. It was so precious. It's a treasure. It's like a gold mine. Every time you go and indulge in sexual immorality, you indulge in masturbation. You are giving it away free of charge to these demons. It came from east. That's why the Bible says, Ye are gods. Everything about you is from God. You were birthed inside of God. Marriage was birthed in the womb of God. The enemy wants to destroy it. With what I've explained to you today, you can now say that there is no place in the Bible for polygamy. It is one soul, one spirit to one spirit. You can see it. It's written in the Bible, black and white. If you don't understand it, call me, I'll explain it again. It's there in the Bible. God took two and joined them together. So whenever you indulge in sexual intercourse, what you are doing is that those two spirits are coming together again because after God separated the spirit of Eve and the spirit of Adam, two of them now, the vacuum has been created. So there's always a need for them to come together. So whenever you get into sex, you remember that time you come into sexual intercourse, what happens is the two spirits now come together and they become one like they were in chapter 2 verse 7. So every time you have sex with somebody, that oneness is done. You are renewing the covenant of two becoming one, which is oneness. That is what happened. That's why sex is called, is called koinonia. Koinonia means an intermingling of two spirits. Sex is not really when the male organ and the, and the female organ come together. No, those are the preparations that help sex to take place. The real sex takes place when the two spirits come together because God separated them when he went to build a woman. So every time you have sex, they come together, they have opportunity to come together again to form the same oneness they had when God breathed the breath of life into Adam. This is what sex is. That's why it is called the origin of sexual attraction. I know and I pray that you have learned something today. I pray that with this knowledge that you have gotten today, you will hold on to God and trust Him for patience to wait for your time. My earnest prayer today is that you stop wasting your God-given energy, that you will hold it, and if you're a married man, you are of all men the most privileged. Hold this thing tight, because every time you have sex with your wife and renew that covenant, you are in engaging in a higher form of worship. I keep saying to people, love making between two legally married partners is one of the highest and purest form of worship. You indulge in a powerful high form of worship when you do that because you are renewing a covenant that was birthed in the womb of God. Hey, it, sex between you and your partner is so beautiful. You renew it every time two of you will come out. Anything you set your mind on to do, you will succeed in it as long as you're not cheating on one another. It is powerful. It is a renewal of covenant that was birthed in the womb of God. I hope, I hope honestly that you have taken this message and that you will continue to act on it. And the Lord God bless you and guide you and give it the grace to live in fulfillment 
of his words which you have heard today. Amen.